Something just killed my dog. Something killed your dog? My dog went flying through the air over the tree. I don't know how it did it. Okay. Deep in Bigfoot territory, episode 13, The Bigfoot War of 1855. This is a Squatch Mafia documentary. Welcome to this episode of Bigfoot Territory. Today we are going to take a closer look at another fascinating old Bigfoot story from Oklahoma. As mentioned in a previous episode covering the Siege of Hanobia, Southeastern Oklahoma has been a hot spot for Bigfoot or Wildman stories and encounters, dating back to the early 19th century. While many attribute the origin of the Sasquatch legend to the dense rainforests and vast wilderness of the Pacific Northwest, the southern regions of the United States have been grappling with Wildman encounters for over 200 years. The story we're exploring today dates back to 1855 and is known as the LeFleur County Bigfoot War. While official documents regarding this classic Bigfoot folklore tale are hard to find, some of the characters in the story are historical figures and all the historic locations mentioned can still be identified today. LaFleur County is actually named after the family of the main character in this historic Bigfoot story, a Choctaw warrior named Joshua LaFleur. The region known today as LaFleur County is situated deep within the Wachita National Forest, at the southern foothills of the Ozark Mountains. The county was established in 1907 when the state of Oklahoma was formed from former Indian territories. As mentioned in previous episodes, the region now encompassing Oklahoma, Arkansas, and East Texas was nearly unpopulated in the early to mid-19th century, consisting mostly of densely forested areas. In 1830, after the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek, various Native American tribes were pushed into this remote and unpopulated region. The ethnic cleansing that became known as the Trail of Tears forced mostly Choctaw, Cherokee, and Muscogee tribes into the region. After only a few years, the first eerie ghost stories of wild men or other Native American devils began circulating from the forests and reservations of southeast Oklahoma. It seems that in the 1840s and 50s, the native tribes of what is now LaFleur County, as well as the European settlers in what is now Arkansas and Oklahoma, experienced the same strange series of events. Across the border in Arkansas, as well as in Indian Territory, several farms were raided, a series that went on for several months in the remote region. 
It is said that large quantities of corn, beans, vegetables, livestock, and other farm animals were stolen from farms and settlements at night. In some cases, even the farm dog went missing. It took some weeks, and all inhabitants of the region, Europeans and natives alike, were aware of the band of marauders. After a while, the settlers began to organize in groups to protect their farms and to trap the nocturnal thieves. But the unknown bandits were cagey, quiet, and never seen. They were also smart, as somehow they never ventured into the settlements or Choctaw encampments on nights when one of the watchmen was in place. Neither did the stealthy thieves ever fall into the traps set for them by farmers outside of the Indian Territory. Those charged with finding and capturing these marauders began to develop a begrudging respect for the wiliness of their adversaries as time went by, and the petty thefts continued. While the thefts were annoying and did cause some hardships, neither the Choctaw nor the neighboring European farmers were too afraid of the food bandits. However, Things changed dramatically in Lafleur County, once women and children began to go missing in the lonely and remote area. As the first stories of missing children began to spread across the reservations and settlements, most of the settlers probably thought a child had simply gotten lost in the forests, or perhaps was attacked by a wild animal. But as women started to disappear in the forests, and children and babies were stolen from their cradles and bedrooms at night, the atmosphere in Lafleur County and the neighboring regions changed. Spurred by reports of these kidnappings, a group of 30 men, mainly consisting of Choctaw cavalrymen, was organized to hunt down the abductors. The group was led by Joshua Lafleur, a man of mixed Choctaw and French blood, and a member of the well-known and influential Lafleur family, who was deeply respected by his fellow tribesmen. This man actually existed. He was born in the Choctaw Nation in 1797, and indeed died in Indian Territory in 1855. Another historically briefed figure who joined the search party was a Choctaw warrior named Hamas Tubby, together with his six sons. The Tubbies were huge men, all approaching seven feet in height and weighing in at more than 300 pounds each, and were regarded as fierce warriors and expert horsemen. The Tubbies were so effective in mounted warfare that despite their massive size, they were known as the light horsemen to the locals. At the time the search party was formed, another series of events unfolded approximately 50 miles westward of Lafleur County in the Kiowa Reservation. The Kiowa, as many other indigenous groups around the world, followed a traditional rite that may seem rude and strange to modern Western people. Kiowa women were placed in a special teepee or tent on the edge of camp when they started their menstrual cycle. The women stayed there being tended to only by older women, until their cycle was complete. The women were considered unclean during their cycles, and Kiowa warriors were not only forbidden any physical contact with the females during this time, they were not even to look upon them. This seems harsh, but is not too different than the way many cultures treated menstruating women in the past. According to the story, there had been dramatic events in this particular Kiowa village, as women were carried off from around that tent on several occasions. 
Finally, in one night, the entire tent was raided and destroyed, and multiple women were abducted. The elders of the tribe suspected that the attackers were attracted by the scent of menstrual blood, and the pheromones emanating from the tent where the menstruating women were housed. Since the tent was on the edge of the village, it proved to be an easy target for the attackers. After a few days, the men from Lafleur County became aware of the kidnappings in the Kiowa Territory and began searching for tracks in the western forests. Additionally, the warriors of the Kiowa tribe joined forces with the search party from Lafleur County. In July of 1855, Following another nocturnal raid on a remote farm, some of the Indian scouts were able to find tracks leading westward into the wilderness, into a region that today is known as the McCurtain County Wilderness Area. Immediately, a search party was formed in the tribal capital of Tuscahoma, and the men began following the tracks into the western forests. It is said that the men rode for over eight hours into the McCurtain County wilderness, crossing rivers now known as Clover River and Little River. Around 4.30 in the afternoon of that day, the troop reached an area where densely forested hills or elevations came into view. The Indian scouts warned Captain Joshua LaFleur that these hills could be the lair of the band of kidnappers. It is said that the troop took a rest while Captain LaFleur observed the surrounding hills and forests with his ship's eyepiece, likely a telescope. After a while, the captain suddenly ordered the troop to fully arm themselves immediately and charged towards one of the hills. What followed next sounds like something straight out of a horror movie. After entering the forested hill, a bestial stench began to envelop the riders, causing nearly all of their horses to go wild and throw off their riders or bolt, until only Captain Lafleur and Hamas Toubey together with his sons, were able to control their horses and reach a clearing on the forested hill. What the men saw was a scene of unspeakable horror. In the middle of the clearing, a mound of rotting human corpses and the carcasses of animals lay decomposing in varying states of decay. The air was thick with a disgusting stench of feces, urine, and the foul odor of rotting flesh. All versions of the story mention the gruesome, bestial stench. It is said that the bodies of 19 women and children were later counted on the hill that day. The men were shocked and disgusted. According to the story, Three large hominid creatures stepped out of the tree line on the opposite side of the clearing and immediately began to attack the men who had entered their lair. Joshua LaFleur, being the first to enter the clearing, promptly opened fire on the creatures. One of the ape-like brutes jumped toward LaFleur and his horse and killed the horse with a single massive punch to the head, while LaFleur emptied his revolver into the creature's chest. 
After his revolver was empty, LaFleur rammed his saber into the body of the beast. However, the monster did not even flinch and instead seized Joshua LaFleur's head with one hand and ripped the head from his shoulder. <gasps> The other men, who had entered the clearing only seconds after LaFleur, watched in shock as the head of their captain was torn off by the gorilla-like giant beast in a bloody and violent slaughter. It is said that the Indians immediately opened fire on the bloodthirsty monsters and blasted the creatures with their 50 caliber buffalo long rifles. Enraged by the gory murder of their captain, the Indians, all experienced hunters and soldiers of old, aimed for the heads of the monsters, killing all three of them with headshots. The story has it that the beast that slew Captain LaFleur was finally put to death by one of the sons of Hamas Tubby, who decapitated the monster with his hunting knife after the creature was shot multiple times. After the gorilla-like monsters were killed, the remaining men stared in shock at the scene before them. Absolute carnage littered the clearing, with the partially consumed bodies of 19 women and children scattered both upon and around the mound. The stench of decaying bodies alone was unbearable, but the overpowering odor of the man-beast's urine and feces was more than the strongest stomach could endure. The creatures were about eight feet tall, covered in hair, and muscular hominids with an estimated weight of around 600 to 700 pounds each. The rotting corpses surrounding the mound appeared to have been lying there for months. After a while, the men began to identify the dead and partly decomposed bodies, mostly those of native women and children, before burying them alongside their slain captain. Then, a large bonfire was built, upon which the corpses of the three giants were burned. Afterward, the troop left the McCurtain County Wilderness area, and the men rode home to their settlements and reservations. It is said that those of the men who witnessed the scenes at the mound were plagued by horrible nightmares that lasted for years, and in some cases, possibly lifetimes. What a story. What is to say after that? At first, what may sound totally outlandish and wild is only one of the earliest stories from the region and the prelude to over 150 years of stories of encounters, attacks, and other strange occurrences throughout Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Eastern Texas. Many well-known Bigfoot cases, such as the Siege of Honobia, the Falk Monster, and the Legend of Boggy Creek, as well as tales about the Big Thicket in East Texas, have occurred in the direct neighborhood of LaFleur County. You can also find a link in the video description below for a Bigfoot Territory episode, covering more old wild man and Bigfoot stories from 19th century Oklahoma and Arkansas. Some of the characters in the story, such as Joshua LaFleur and Hamas Tubby, are historically documented figures who definitely existed. Additionally, all places mentioned are either real historic locations or still exist today. The story is part of the oral tradition of the natives in the region and is referenced in at least two books, Tall Mountain Stories by Dr. Tuklo Neshoba and True Bigfoot Horror by Jeremy Kelly. Moreover, elders of the Kiowa tribe in Oklahoma have confirmed the story to a Sasquatch researcher named Jim King. The Ozarks and the Wachita National Forest have remained notorious places in Bigfoot lore and hotspots in the cryptid underground to this day. Countless ghost stories and tales of mysterious beings of all sorts still emerge from the remote region.
In some versions of the story, the monsters are only referred to as giants. In other versions, they are described as a band of giant cannibalistic Indians or feral humans. From today's perspective, the description of the giants certainly resembles that of Bigfoot. There are, of course, many native tales in which the Sasquatch is described as highly aggressive, attacking people or stealing women and children. Many tribes tell stories in which they describe areas of their territory that were totally off limits, and the natives refused to go there, even if these territories were full of game and other food sources. Because these areas were believed to be the territories and hunting grounds of the Sasquatch. And, of course, there are also known stories from modern times in which the Sasquatch is linked to disappeared or missing persons. For example, in the case of Port Chatham on the Kenai Peninsula in Alaska. There are even documented cases in which chimpanzees and other apes were known to raid human villages, stealing human babies, and eating them. These cases are documented in Africa, as well as India, mostly during times of famine. But among all these obscure Bigfoot stories and native legends, the 1855 Bigfoot War in Lafleur County is certainly one of a kind. What is your opinion on this old campfire story from 19th century Oklahoma? Have you witnessed something strange in the Ozarks or the Owachita National Forest? Let me know in the comments. Hit the like button if you have enjoyed this episode of Bigfoot Territory. Subscribe to the Squatch Mafia channel at YouTube for more videos on Bigfoot and Sasquatch. Check out Squatch Mafia at Patreon and TikTok for extra content. Thank you for watching.